Hello, welcome. My name is Daniela Bleichmar. I am the director of the Levan Institute for the Humanities at USC. Thank you for joining us today in this book chat to celebrate the publication of Jennifer Peterson's new book, How Machines Came to Speak, Media Technologies and Freedom of Speech, published by Duke University Press earlier this year. Many thanks today to uh, the two interlocutors who are joining us to discuss the book with Jen. Xiao Chang Li, who is assistant professor in the Department of Communication at Stanford University, and Sida Badianathan, who is Robertson Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. The conversation will be moderated by Nitin Govel, who is Associate Professor of Cinematic Arts at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. And today's discussion is organized by the Levan Institute for the Humanities in collaboration with three partners at USC, the Annenberg Center for Collaborative Communication, the Center for Law, History and Culture, and the Center on Science, Technology and Public Life. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, the program for today is very simple. Um, please do turn on your camera if you are able to. It's nicer to see uh, real life humans on Zoom than uh, names or, or still photos. Um, Jen, Jennifer uh, uh, will talk uh, for about five minutes about her book, and then she will be in conversation with our two interlocutors uh, until about for about 30 minutes, roughly, and then uh, we will open it up for questions. So, Jen, congratulations on your book, and please tell us about it. Thank you so much. And um, Xiaocheng, uh, Siva, and Nitin, thank you so much for um, doing the work of being interlocutors and, and moderators. And Daniela, Isabella, and Zach, thank you so much for uh, organizing. Um, so uh, when I started writing a book on the history of free speech, I think some people thought, um, why do we really need another one of these? This is like really well-worn terrain. Um, there are lots of good histories of the First Amendment or censorship. Um, but um, I'm doing something a little different from most of these histories. Most of these histories um, are really interested in the story of legal rights and civil liberties and the ways that they have expanded. So a history of the freedoms uh, in free speech. Um, these histories focus on um, uh, how liberties were expanded to more different acts of expression. So for example, strikes, um, burning flags, things like this, and more different spaces. So for example, city streets or the internet. And in these histories, the drivers of legal change tend to be politics, um, normative rationales and commitments, uh, social movements or political changes on the court. Now, and I was really interested in a different set of questions, more fundamental issues than these um, questions about, and, and I think these really inform the political histories that are more common. I was interested in how the courts define what counts as speech. Um, what, uh, you know, what counts as, as an utterance to use a term that the courts used to use a lot? Does it have to be cognitive? Does it have to have a message or a human recipient, a sender? Um, does it need to use words? In the early 20th century, the answers to questions like these seemed very, very clear to the courts. By the end of the 20th century, the answers were far from certain. Uh, things were quite muddy. And I think that new technologies and closely linked transformations in knowledge and discourse about communication play an under um, recognized role in this change in making more different things legible as speech, both to people bringing legal claims and to Supreme Court justices. Um, so I should say that legal scholars will tell you that not all communication counts as speech. There's a technical meaning to the term. Um, and so, I'm, and I'm interested in how this technical meaning of speech, so it's a legal category, it's a category within the law, and this has a history, and I'm interested in how the types and forms of communication that count as speech have been, um, you know, what has counted at different times, and how these rationales have been made, how the decisions have been made about what counts as speech at different times. 
And one of the big um, points that I'm making is that this is not shaped only by like grand theories, normative rationales, uh, philosophy, but also by the mundane, um, the things we use to communicate um, our techniques and technologies. So I'm arguing that the history of free speech is shaped by, among other things, the way that media we use media technologies to communicate with one another and how they shape our ability to enter into public conversation and to talk to each other. And the book looks at several moments where speech is redefined by a culture and law um, and from the use of and, and technology, from the use of uh, moving images to tell stories and give news reports in the early 20th century to the structural transformation of the public sphere uh, via radio and broadcast that turned most people into listeners rather than potential speakers uh, in the mid century. And finally to computer code and algorithms and the use of these to communicate in the, in the turn of the 21st century. Each of these I think has affected and revised social and legal conceptions of speech. And so I offer a genealogy of the speech and free speech in this book. And I think that this angle and this genealogy, this approach gives us a couple of important things. Um, first, uh, many of the histories of free speech as a expansion of legal rights are somewhat linear progress narratives and they're celebratory. More and more people are enfranchised in this and it's kind of unproblematic narrative. And I think by focusing on um, the history of speech, we see a much more complicated, less linear narrative where we see not so much people marking, marching forward, but terrain shifting. Um, and I, this can perhaps intervene in some of the ways in which we um, think about where we are today. And um, second, and I think relatedly, this genealogy helps us understand some of the conflicts and confusions about how to apply the First Amendment today. For example, in um, cases involving new technologies or involving corporate speech. Um, in the near, and so the ways in which speech has been defined are, I think, important drivers of, of decisions like this. And right now, you know, um, this helps us understand our present, understanding our future. You know, we're undergoing another set of um, rapid change in communication. And in the near, near term, this means that um, new technologies are going to be bringing up novel questions about, you know, is this speech? We've seen our Facebooks like speech, likes speech. We are going to see things about computer generated text or speech and whether or not these count as speech for First Amendment purposes. And I think these cases, uh, understanding the role of the definition of speech is really important to um, understanding what's going to be going on in legal debates and popular debates around this and perhaps to the extent that we want to intervene, intervening in the definitions of speech are an important place uh, for intervening and thinking about how First Amendment, uh, the future direction of First Amendment um, as applied to new technologies. Um, but also in the longer term, I think that we will see 20, 30 years down the line, probably a subtle or not so subtle shift in the way that the courts are deciding cases. If history is any um, guide to the future, um, we are likely to see different articulations of or ways of thinking about the boundaries of speech than we do today. Ones that are informed by our practices um, of dealing with um, algorithmically moderated uh, platforms, et cetera. So we're likely to see some big shifts in how speech is defined and applied in the coming years. And I think this focus on speech and understanding this history can give us some uh, uh, inroads and insight into this. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I'll invite Xiao Chang and Siva into the conversation. Xiao Chang, do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I just want to say what an absolute pleasure it was to get the chance to really kind of sit down and dig into this really fantastically rich and engaging book about law and media as really mutually informing technical domains in a sense, right? Um, and I, I wanna kind of impress upon the audience here, many of whom will not have had a chance to read the book yet, how you managed to really capture this really sprawling history that spans essentially the entirety of the 20th century into the 21st, taking us through all these ongoing negotiations over the boundaries of speech as a legal category, as it starts to get reconfigured over and over again, 
under new pressures from both the sort of changing forms and changing scale of communication practices, the emergence of new roles, different kinds of cultural stratifications, especially racialized stratifications um, and sort of embodied identities and the kind of material technologies and infrastructures that end up shaping the sort of production, transmission and encounter with speech or forms of expression, right? Um, and the absolute wizardry with which you manage to draw together these very like sweeping and complex and deeply tangled transformations that are happening across domains of like law, right? Technological arrangements, institutional configurations across like broadcast uh, production, telecommunications and computing industries, all through what's actually a very nuanced and intricate account of the changing priorities and competing claims over what speech is and does and how it gets defined, evaluated, and authorized. Um, so I just want well, to say that was, you know, absolutely astonishing kind of going through um, this book and like the kind of almost deceptive elegance with which you managed to bring all these pieces together. Um, and so I think one of the really fascinating through lines that I thought maybe would be a good starting point for us is this ongoing tension that appears throughout the book between sort of forms of embodied actions and the kind of increasing abstraction of speech, both in terms of the sort of distance that sort of expands between like a source of expression um, and its modes of dissemination in the context of things like as you shift from newspapers to broadcast, um, but also in terms of the ab abstraction into discrete units of information as you start getting into like the mid-century information theory and then software where the problem of action kind of returns in new forms as it shifts from sort of the embodied action to the actions of the machine um, and the executions of the program. So I was wondering, you know, thinking across all of this, was there, you know, it's certainly not a linear mode of progress, but do you see a kind of historical trajectory that we can categorize in at least the choreography between these sort of uh, embodied and abstracting forces uh, in the definition of speech? Yeah, I think um, there are two main trajectories and they are somewhat distinct but they do intersect at points that I, I see across the, the history, the history I look at. Um, the first is about the relationship of speech to action. And um, this is a really important thing, um, probably for all of us, but certainly for um, lawyers and legal uh, actors, because what is speech is protected and what is action is regulatable. Um, so if you want to protest in the middle of the street, you know, um, the action part of that is um, being in the middle of the street might be regulated. The protest part of what you want to say is, is speech. But so this is a really important line. And um, so one thing is one history is that um, history of the relationship of speech to action. This changes across this history, how it's policed um, being um, really about De, um, defining and delineating the difference between um, uh, expression and bodies and bodily comportment. So it's kind of a mind-body discussion that's wrapped up in a bunch of other things um, that involve like race, gender, immigration, um, work and workers' disputes. Um, and by the end of the 20th century, though, the way that speech and action are being defined and policed are much more about automation. So speech is something that is authored, it has a will, it has a person behind it in, in certain conversations. Um, and um, the actions are actions of the machine. So the ways in which this is being defined and policed and, and what the concerns that animate that, that, um, that boundary are quite different by the time we get to the end of the 20th century. The other main arc, so that's first main arc. The second main arc is the relationship of speech to speakers. Um, and at the beginning of the 20th century, right, speech is, you know, kind of obviously something that people do um, and that is attached to particular persons and bodies. And in fact, the judges and justices are really concerned with things like persuasion, turning minds, conscience, will. Almost any time they're thinking about um, words, words are ways of conveying like inner mental states. And they're very concerned with mental work and, and as part of what they're protecting. 
um, by the end of the 20th century, you know, we also have ways of talking about speech quite disarticulated from speakers, um, where anything can be talked about as in information. Uh, information is understood to be speech, and so this is a way of kind of um, disarticulating speech from speakers. It, it arose out of a, an attempt to, um, uh, without getting too much into the weeds, it arose out of an attempt to um, keep the First Amendment from only protecting the interests of media owners in the 1930s and 1940s. So it was meant as a progressive kind of thing, but it has ended up being an important um, rationale for corporate speech. And we can get into that more later, perhaps. But those are the two trajectories. And I do think that they intersect a little bit in um, the ways in which uh, in the late 20th century, they're both kind of um, how we're defining the line between speech and action, like in code, this is very textualized. So when we're trying to understand if code is speech, we're not understanding whether code is anything sim similar to an utterance, something one, uh, one might do in a social situation. It's really is code text. So the shift of conversation has moved almost entirely from considerations of um, uh, um, embodied action uh, socially situated actions. And, you know, in the early 20th century, there's a lot of concerns about this. Judges and justices are like concerned about fighting words. It's co-presence is really important there and people being in the same space. And that the, the fact that this is uttered rather than printed is explicitly referenced as part of its, um, power and force. By the time we get to the end, end of the 20th century, it all is kind of the same, um, right? And everything is very textualized. And so I think in that way, the speech action conversation overlaps with the, um, the uh, informationalization of speech that is disarticulates speech from um, particular persons who are speaking. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, this is a, a, a really exciting event, uh, not just because the book is so cool, uh, and I'll explain why I think it's so cool in a minute, but um, I'm thrilled to see so many uh, people I've known for a long time, people I've recently met, and people I want to meet uh, in this gathering. Uh, it's, I, I think, uh, the fact that so many great people showed up to this uh, says a lot, Jennifer, about um, how well you are regarded uh, in our profession and among our friends, uh, but also how exciting and interesting this subject is at this moment. Um, I th I think you hit it really well. Like I think I think you have written. I know you've written an extremely important book. Um, as I went through this book, uh, almost every page, I just kept saying, "Yeah, yeah," because you know the best books do this, right? Um, I had half-baked thoughts about much of this, and you put words to it. You grounded my half-baked, you fully baked my my half-baked thoughts, and and then brought me to new places uh, as well, um, uh, ways I hadn't uh, connected things, um, uh, language I hadn't imagined appro uh, appropriating for for these sorts of subjects. Uh, and so I I just found the experience of reading this book to be energizing um, and exciting and. And I, I'm also, I have to say, like, you know, I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember back when this was gestational to you, right? It, it, you were asking these questions um, in, a, in a very uh, uh, sort of careful and systematic way, um, actually long before you finished your first book. <laughs> you know, it's just, these are questions you were asking long ago. And um, I've lost count of the number of years uh, when you started asking these questions. Um, and so it's super exciting to me to see that those questions you asked all those years ago um, built like a coral reef into something really substantial, really important, and 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 I think really beautiful. So congratulations on this book. Um, it's uh, uh, I'm like I can't wait to teach it. Like I'm ready to I'm ready to order a bunch uh, and 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 make sure my students. Uh, uh, encounter this book, uh, both in my undergrad media law classes, which I always strive to push beyond the case study, Whiggish um, expansion of freedom story that uh, through which we've had media and communication and journalism law taught at the undergraduate level for so long, but also uh, in, in graduate classes in which we theorize media and technology um, because you do it in such a beautiful way.
what really struck me here is that you caught American judges and justices throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century theorizing about media and technology without realizing they're theorizing about media and technology. It's like, oh, guess what you were doing? You know, and, and they wouldn't have even recognized that practice. They're trying to make sense of the facts at hand. They're trying to make sense of applying um, received doctrine to new conditions. Uh, and you recognize how challenging that can be at particular historical moments. Um, and, and you tell those stories really well with the, with the data they offer you. Um, but you're there after the uh, decades after the fact, sometimes uh, more than a century after the fact, saying, you know what you're really doing here is you're making sense of uh, a technological moment for which there was no precedent. Um, and so to, um, to show students the act of theorizing is, is something we all, you know, we all look for those texts that, that help us get to that place. And I think this does it really well. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm also struck by the fact, and this is sort of where I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna ask a question. <laughs> um, the shift from looking at the notion of free speech or free expression instead of as a, um, an unfolding of individual rights, right? As you said, a focus on the individual, a focus on the speech, it, the, the content of the speech itself, or the message of the speech itself, to one where you center the question of what counts as speech. It occurred to me that this makes so much sense when you get beyond the United States and you talk about different conflicts and questions over free expression outside beyond the United States and between the United States and other countries. And so um, I, I immediately started thinking about the controversy over the McBride report in 1980 and the notion of free flow and the ways in which the United States recoiled because the McBride Commission made all, you know, made its recommendations and its observations largely with the same process of theorizing that you went through, understanding that things were different, understanding there was a global ecosystem of information flow, not just utterance, mm -hmm. right? That there was a dynamic system here. And so when you look at that immediate conflict, that allergy that the United States had to the McBride report, it seems to me like you have identified the fact that the United States despite doing what it has done, as you've outlined it here, um, retained its official um, statement of policy and theory based on liberal individualism. And the McBride Report said, no, there's something else going on here. So here's what I'd love you to do. Could you bounce off of that? Could you run with that? Can you imagine, I know you didn't do quite this in your book, but like, can you imagine a way in which your framework helps us think through global flows of information and global conflicts and tensions about free expression. So I would love to do that. Comparative legal stuff is really, really, really um, complicated. And um, I don't know as much about other countries' legal systems. And I'm really happy to hear you say that this actually addresses international things, because this is one of my like biggest kind of um, limitations in this is I feel so US centric and, and so hampered by that in some ways. And I have actually thought about this history as potentially being really idiosyncratic to the United States because we have a very weird guarantee of freedom of speech. Absolutely. Other countries have more kind of expansive or uh, definitions of freedom of speech or ones that focus on art. Um, political discussion explicitly in the, you know, in the constitutions, but we have Freedom, um, the, the you know, Congress shall make no law, you know, to abridge freedom of speech or the press. And we talk about this as a very um, kind of abstract category, but my take is no, this was actually really technologically specific, um, that this was a way of naming the two major technologies of public communication of the day, the body in oration and the printing press. And where we get into trouble is in when all of this changes in the 20th century, when we start having all these other forms of communication, mass communication, importantly, not interpersonal communication. First is movies, you know, mass medium and a commercial medium telling stories, doing kinds of um, work that discourse does different from photography, say, um, arguably. 
Um, I think there's a lot of other reasons why film is the first uh, case that kind of comes up. Um, but you have this proliferation of different um, you know, technologies and techniques that don't fit within speech or the press necessarily. So we start doing this work to define and create these categories that are treated as these, you know, kind of abstract categories um, and, and work these new examples into them. And I think actually this is when I can't be sure, um, but I think I don't quite have the evidence to fully make the case, but I think this is when speech became a term of art is exactly when this happened. I think speech was quite self-evident in the 19th century. Um, and of course, in the 19th century, most free speech discussions happen at the state level because the First Amendment didn't really address um, state law until then. So it's a, it's a complicated case to make. But I think that it was quite evident what it was and it becomes a term of art and becomes something that we do these weird intellectual and discursive um, gymnastics around. I, I, Talked, I remember being on a, a panel once with a lawyer for the ACLU, and she talked about how weird our, our law, our First Amendment is, and it forces um, claimants, judges, and lawyers to put you know, square pegs in round holes, she said, essentially, because it, it has this technological specificity. So I've seen it as potentially a idiosyncratically American issue, though I have, I, I would um, tend to think I am, have perhaps enough of a, um, technological um, determinist streak uh, and, and you know a modern technological determinist streak to think that this is probably the case in other places as well in other countries as well and in, in, um, well in I do not, think the, so yeah the idiosyncratic nature that you've identified is I think you're right about that mm -hmm. I think that so the, I think the real thing is the contrast with the rest yeah. of the world right mm -hmm. that the rest of the world sees the United States as idiosyncratic as mm -hmm. an outlier mm -hmm. and and, and again, hasn't fully articulated in the way you have. So that's why I think the real value of this book beyond the United States is to sort of show um, what kind of work was going on in the law without full recognition of it, while we still hold on to um, a very archaic theory of free speech when we, when we discuss it publicly. Thank you. That is an excellent avenue of argumentation and conversation, yeah. Yeah, thank you both. If Xiao Chang, I'll ask if you, if you and Siva have any follow-ups. I, I thought this was also an interesting point to make in terms of a broad takeaway from the book around this question of technological determinism, Jen, because it seems to me that, you know, th there, there's both a narrative about technological determinism, but a counter-narrative there as well, what you call technological specificity. I think that would be interesting for uh, the, uh, a wider audience as well. Can you maybe take us through a little bit of what you see as the operative distinction, both methodologically and conceptually, between technological determinism and technological specificity? I think Xiao Chang and Siva's work speaks to this as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, technological determinism that got a bad name a few decades ago was this idea that technologies are sort of developed and innovated by wonderful. Um, pioneers and they come in and have effects on society. And uh, this is not the technological determinism that I'm interested in. I do think technologies have um, uh, a shaping role in society and culture. And that, um, but it's not like, as if these technologies are not designed by people. It's not as if people aren't making decisions around how they adopt uh, and use these technologies. Um, but I think that in my field, we swung so far away from, there's such a reaction to technological determinism that everyone was so social constructivist that all we could talk about were human uses and decisions. And we were not attending uh, in some ways to um, the spe specificities of technologies and the types of um, uh, ways that those technologies we use for something like communication shape uh, make certain forms of communicating easy, make others hard. They have affordances that um, kind of direct us. And I'm far, far from alone in this uh, kind of move back to sort of like embracing a way of talking about technology as having, um, you know, kind of important shaping effects and paying attention to those, the technological affordances of both new and old technologies. Like we talk about this a lot with new technologies, but applying that also to old technologies. Sure. Xiao Chang, Siva, any follow up? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll follow up from there and starting to think about the kind of technological specificity and really the sort of 
operational specificities that you start to surface um, in this book, right? In the, not only the kind of uh, material configurations, but the very particular relationships and the shifting locus of speech within the sort of larger technological machinery of these uh, communication systems. And so, you know, I'm, I want to ask a, a kind of question that I, as a historian, hate getting, but I'm going to make you um, answer it now, which is to kind of really uh, extrapolate some of these um, elements into the present and perhaps into the future as we think about, you know, as I was especially even reading the chapter on film, right, the, these kinds of discourses around uh, the question of whether it was expression because it was mere reproduction, right, the need to identify a kind of agential uh, force, a kind of deliberateness and like reasoned, that kind of like enlightenment hangover um, yeah. discourse. Um, and as we kind of move into these uh, essentially like uh, algorithmic decision making systems in which we're not only seeing right uh, sort of textual behaviors emerging out of rhythm algorithms in terms of like things like text generation and chatbots, but uh, kind of expressive environments right that it is about the kind of algorithmic sorting of material and clustering and filtering of material together that actually carries the expressive force that is not necessarily in, a, in any single piece of uh, how you see these concerns about right the disarticulation and the mechanical reproduction all of these different factors that are coming through um how you might see them playing out in the present and into the future yeah um so on film just to kind of fill in um Film was not considered speech in 1915, and it was because partly because it was a business and it was commerce, but also very importantly because it was seen as closer to physical action in some ways or, or behavior. It was not aligned with um, opinion and mental activity. There were no um, real authors or speakers. Right, films were merely copies or representations of ideas that had been published and made known elsewhere. And so there was sort of like, and the actors were just reenacting something in front of the camera. And so there wasn't really anything going on. There was no speakers. There were no, um, uh, you know, no ideas in a sense. Um, so uh, there you have a real strong desire to have um, a mind, and and uh, speech is defined in part like by uh, that which is you know making exterior some kind of novel or new idea that somebody holds in their in their brain. Um, and so they're really looking for agents. Yes, and we have then. Um, as I as we've kind of talked about, there's an elaboration of other ways of talking about speech where you don't have to have agents that emerges in the 19s, really, I think in the 1970s. Um, but the interesting thing to me is in current cases where we see algorithms and such, we have two different ways of deciding the law. We have this agent-centered, more kind of liberal humanist rationale um, or theory of speech. And we have this more, um, you know, impersonal uh, way of talking about speech um, that doesn't require agents, it doesn't require speakers, but requires just information to flow. Um, and they could use either of these to talk about algorithms. So far, the courts are dead set on finding a person and they over attribute. So um, anything that comes out of an algorithm is the product of the, algor the creator of the algorithm. They're really, really into making this a lot like, um, you know, uh, word processing in a sense, or, you know, any other kind of classic utterance. And, and there's some complicated reasons for this. And you're making it like uh, publishing a newspaper, right? This is very advantageous to the companies who are bringing these, these cases. Um, so um, there is a real sense, a real desire to kind of, you know, um, look for agents there. And again, it's this concern about automation and computers. I don't know how long that will last. Um, and I came to this kind of thinking, oh, these new technologies are kind of like maybe breaking this kind of problematic idea of who the speaker and the subject is in the law. And perhaps we're going to see something creative and wonderful and new. 
by the end of writing the book, I'm a little pessimistic about that. Um, one, because when we've done that in the past, it hasn't really necessarily worked for the people it meant to work for. It hasn't, it worked for a minute to like enfranchise the public, but pretty quickly, um, any kind of new articulation of speech that is meant to be um, better attend the technology or address the public, it, it's pretty easy for that to be captured and, and used to expand, say, corporate rights. So I'm a little pessimistic on those terms, but also um, there is a there is also a, a, a clinging to this um, older definition to print to the liberal subject that I think that legal practitioners will do for quite a long time. And I'm I'm kind of, you know, I'm a little ambivalent about it at this point. I certainly, I'm not nostalgic for that subject. It's really problematic, really exclusionary. Um, and it's not a very good social description of I think what we do in our, in our um in our communication. So I see opportunities for redefining speech in ways that are um, center of relations and relationality, that are more ethical, that are you know, more engaged with feminist critiques of um, the social and of um, you know, the ways in which we think about uh, subjects as autonomous. However, I'm also a little skeptical and concerned about that. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Well, We're going to open things to wider question. Let's see, but please, a, a quick follow up, and then yeah, we'll... I, I mean, I'd I'd love to cue you to talk a bit about chapter two, which to me was um, the most surprising and in many ways exciting part of the book. Um, you start the chapter two, and and film is is really at the center of it, right? You start chapter two talking about how the courts in 1915 decided that film doesn't count as speech for really interesting reasons. Um, that we can't just laugh away, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, you end chapter two with a basically a reversal of that position. Yeah. Uh, and it covers about 40 years, cru a crucial 40 years in American media history and political history. And what struck me is there's that undercurrent of coping with two things. One, the recognition of, of modernism, but secondly, the notion of propaganda and the threat of propaganda to the to the democratic project. So, with that set up, can you give us a sense of, um, especially given our current propagandistic moment, like what role do those things play in in the unfolding of your story in in this chapter? What role do you what which things? I mean, propaganda and the notion that um, uh, how, do, how does the, the the presence of propaganda, the coping with propaganda? Um, alter how judges and others thought about what counts as speech and, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, how, how do we end up with a very different world after World War II? So I, I think that propaganda and the, the um, concerns with propaganda as a psychological form of manipulation have a lot to do with transformations in, in how people were thinking about public opinion. So in the teens, public opinion was something that well-educated, reasoned elites did. Um, by you know the point that you're talking about in chapter two, public opinion was something everybody had. We're all kind of irrational, and I think propaganda is central to this. And the judges, you know, in 1915 would have seen themselves as above this in a sense. Um, by the 40s, they do not. They very much see themselves as also having psychologies, as operating through symbols, and um, they also see themselves as having biases that they need to protect against, and they're beginning to develop these tests in order to make themselves better social scientists in a sense, um, and not to just use their subjective judgment in order to decide what is good and bad. Say, if we're talking about speech, speech that is dangerous, they used to, the judges used to think they just knew it when they saw it. Um, by the 40s, they did not. They had to have a bit more of a, a what to them seemed like a rigorous test. So I think the psychological fears around propaganda are huge, but it has to do with the ways that are, are huge in how um, we're thinking about um, the minds of the public and the minds of judges making decisions. We have just over 15 minutes for questions. So if I can invite folks to use the raise hand function or uh, maybe type your question in the chat and I'll do my best to move between them. And if we can keep those questions specific as possible so we can get Jen's response. Who wants to lead us off? I've got a question too, in case people are shy. So start things off. Jen, maybe a, maybe a somewhat um, 
uh, sort of unusual question given given your archive. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, you're, so much of what you're doing in the book deals with the law as sort of a site of encounter, uh, and you're looking primarily at jurisprudence and uh, and legal opinion. Uh, but I wonder uh, whether or not you can say something, and this is something maybe Siva or Tom or other folks may know in the room. Um, you know how how free speech is being taught in the mm -hmm. law school classroom has changed over. Um, the last 20 years and maybe where you see that going. I know this is maybe a bit out of the ambit yeah. of, of your specific area, but thinking about sort of where the law materializes and where things take place in, in terms of institutions of education, do you have a thought on that? Um, so law is taught in classrooms um, from what I know, which is not a huge amount, but, but, but from talking to some uh, law professors and uh, students, um, right, this is taught more as um, in terms of kind of doxas, doctrine, um, sorry. And uh, so what is current law? What is binding at a particular moment? So you won't learn as much about history in the classroom. Um, for media scholars, um, I hope this isn't too in the weeds. There's a case called Red Lion. Um, that is all about how audiences have a right to receive information. Um, and that is not, most law students don't know about this. Like every media studies uh, student or many media studies students who study history uh, will know about this, but it's just not taught because it has been backed away from, not expressly overturned, but backed away from. It's no longer considered to be kind of controlling or important law. So there is a focus on, um, you know, kind of present and what has survived rather than um, older kind of uh, traditions in, in law. I don't know so much how law training has changed, but I think that the what I can say is the sources of expertise in legal thinking and decision making have changed a bit in the across the 20th century from ones that are focused a bit more on literature, linguistics, philosophy, et cetera. That's where we would turn, that's where legal practitioners would turn to, to think through these things, to, to more like economics, um, uh, engineering uh, sites like this. These are the authoritative sources of knowledge and, and law would like to be more like many, uh, I, I don't want to P2 general, um, but I think many legal schools and, and many uh, characterizations of law um, would place it more with economics today than with philosophy. And I think that's very different from the early 20th century. Siva, I saw you nodding uh, at Jen's characterization of law students. Does that dovetail with your experience? Well, certainly at the just the, the, the basic free speech and constitutional law uh, level, yeah, they're not going to get into um, really uh, uh, fascinating cases like Red Line, which mean a lot, again, in our industry and in, in the, the world of media policy. But um, when they get to questions of privacy and regulation, there often is a more expansive take. One of the things I've seen that's really interesting happening in law schools right now is a, a, a reassessment of, uh, of First Amendment doctrine from a feminist point of view um, with the recognition of the proliferation of real harm that we have in our current moment uh, and the sense that uh, First Amendment doctrine doesn't account for the very different levels of harm and effect uh, that impact different people in our society. Um, and so we're starting to see at the intersection of privacy law and tort law, uh, a, 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 a fairly strong pushback against uh, any sort of First Amendment fundamentalism. Um, and so I think there's some really cool things going on right now in the legal academy that um, might, might make bigger headlines soon. And it seems to me, and I don't know if you're seeing this, um, you know, at, at the law school, Siva, but I'm hearing, you know, in public discourse also some ways in which arguments that were made by critical race scholars, um, you know, in the 90s, and that didn't, they got a lot of uptake, you know, in legal circles, but not popularly, are in some ways being revisited, you know, about the harms of um, speech as more people experience this via technologies. So some of the arguments about silencing, say part of the harms of uh, hate speech is silencing is being rearticulated, not necessarily in terms of race and hate speech, but when we talk about like what um, bad social media policy can do, it can silence people. So it feels like 
um, there's a way in which some of these concerns are taken up, though not always through the lens of race anymore that emerged from considerations of race, but that are being applied and, and, and talked about a bit more because many other people have this experience of being silenced by the speech of others. Other thoughts or questions? Jen, you mentioned hate speech towards the end of your uh, comment, uh, and it made me think, and, I, and even others uh, may also know your, your earlier uh, book on the 1998 murder of Matthew Shepard, um, and I'm wondering if you can maybe draw those, uh, those connections um, uh, across the two books. I, I think, you, for me at least, uh, it, it, in, in terms of speech, of course, there are lots of connections, but even the broad way in which you treated the institution of news made me think about how you treated the institution of the law as well. What were you thinking about in terms of connections across these two books, both what's sort of explicit, but also in terms of your own thinking as you move from one project yeah. to another? Yeah, so that the first book looked at um, the media coverage and passage of um, hate crimes laws um, into murders, uh, James Byrd Jr., who is a black man who is targeted based on his race, and Matthew Shepard, who was a young gay man targeted based on his sexuality. And um, I got interested in thinking about first the free speech, you know, partly through thinking about uh, hate speech, which was part of the conversation around these. And um, so that's one of the kind of like, that is a very real way in which just my thinking about the First Amendment was partly driven by thinking about hate speech. But also thematically, I think in both cases, I'm looking at how law is shaped by media in some way. And the first, it's media culture and um, emotional. I was particularly interested in the role of emotion uh, in that case and emotional mediation by, you know, in media culture shape the law. And in this case, I'm looking at the ways in which, you know, the technologies and our uses shape the law. So media is not just regulated by law, but is also shaping. Um, and the other strand is really about emotion and reason. One of the things that I was really interested in when I first started this project was thinking about history of free speech as a history of talking about what is good communication, right? Especially if we're thinking about the, the kind of um, normative discussions about what should be protected in free speech. We're thinking about what good does speech do? And this is a site where we talk a lot about um, reason and emotion. And I was interested in taking a historical approach to understanding how reason and, um, uh, and emotion had been figured in free speech discourse. We have a question in the chat from Morton who asks, I know I'm asking a historian to project into the future, but do you have any thoughts about what criteria would be applicable to an AI before we would grant it enough quote unquote personhood to mm -hmm. receive free speech rights? Where do we cut the creator slash manufacturer umbilical cord in that context? Yeah. So one of the things that's kind of interesting about a case like this is what's at stake in granting um, an AI uh, speech rights. Often this would be um, a commercial product, right? If we're thinking about the use of something like, you know, one of these models that are out there right now, um, it's employed by a corp, usually, like sometimes it'll be an artist or something like that, but often these are, you know, it's a product that is a commercial product. Um, so thinking about Google search results is another case where there's a technology where we're thinking about, is this speech? But part of what's at stake here is the ability of a corporate owner to, um, say, oh, this is speech, so it's protected. And often that is a way, not necessarily only of gaining political liberties or allowing people to speak via your technology. It's often actually a way of gaining, um, you know, protecting yourself as a company from economic regulation. So one of the things to think about, one of the kind of frameworks for thinking about questions about an a, you know, uh, like a GPT-3 or some other kind of model uh, being, you know, the outputs of some kind of algorithmic um, model being considered speech are um, whether this is 
an example potentially of what some people call First Amendment opportunism, right? The you know, companies claiming rights for products. So we're not thinking about people using these things, but these are products that are being protected. Um, so that's one context. And thinking about you know, whether this should be considered um, given you know, protection of speech, I think is partly thinking about the context in which these cases are made. And I think this actually highlights one of the problems in the way that we reason around speech, which is often these technologically, it's like, is this technology speech? And that's often the wrong question. Often the right question is, what is happening in this moment and in this context and in this deployment? So, you know, not our video game speech, but what particular set of actions or interactions are going on there? What particular deployments or uses of an AI, um, you know, that generates um, text or speech um, is protected and what is not? But we do have a tendency to look at it in terms of the technology and then define you know, this is speech, the products of this thing. And I think that that um, is uh, problematic in a number of ways. We've got a few minutes. If there are any further questions or any thoughts or Xiao Chang, if you wanted to jump in at any point, please do. Tom, please. Thanks for this, um, Jen and um, everyone. Um, it's it's all fascinating, and uh, it's so great to hear a discussion that doesn't struggle with to get to a point where it's resisting um, First Amendment fundamentalism, um, and because uh, it's still out there, and uh, the the. Um, this is maybe a little bit too much like the last question, but I know uh, um, in Zephyr Teachout's book on corruption, there's a chapter which she kind of toned it down, where but she makes the argument that, and I'm glossing here a bit, that, well, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but for free speech is just a dead idea. It doesn't work. It only serves, for the reasons you just explained, Jen, it, that it, it only serves large corporate interests. And it's basically against democracy now. And so what we need to do is reframe everything in terms of a, demo a, level, a law of democracy. What is What will help democracy? That should be the first question out of the gate. Um, of course, that's, that's, that's a big grand argument. And when she, I think when she gave a version of that talk to various academic audiences, you know, the jaws would hit the floor and they'd all what, how can you get rid of the First Amendment? And so, Jen, you're, you're, you are the opposite of a kind of, you know, firecracker throwing scholar. <laughs> and uh, so like, do you have a way of talking about that kind of shift that might talk maybe about just moving in a more direction towards democracy away from the term speech or the idea of uh, free speech? So yeah, I wouldn't want to get rid of free speech. I think there's all kinds of wonderful things that it protects. It's particularly good at um, insulating us from some of the worst abuses of a demagogic kind of leader, like, right? I was very happy to have all of the particular um, protections we have during the Trump presidency, right? This is kind of what it was designed to put the guardrails on somebody like that, um, not being able to do things like um, fire uh, Colin Kaepernick or demand that he is fired and things like that. So we had a lot of uh, Trump attempts to intervene in journalism that we have pretty good legal protections against. This is awesome. Um, and one of the reasons that we have today so many, you know, it's kind of a, a famous um, one liner that you know the biggest beneficiaries of the first amendment right now are corporations and there's a lot of reasons for that and some of them are because of um you know the immense amount of money corporations have the way that they are crafting um really kind of amazing in the way that many more things are informational so many more things run on code and on information so they're subject to um including in um 
uh, as its speech potentially now. So there's all kinds of ways in which one can make opportunistic arguments. But the other reason is actually not a bad one, which is that we've done a lot of the work of getting ourselves pretty good protections for citizens, you know, average citizens, um, dissenters, minority, like a lot of that work was done in, um, you know, the 20th century. And so there is a decent free speech um, edifice that I, um, while I don't, I'm not as triumphant, uh, uh, triumphant about it, or as, you know, um, seeing it as the best necessarily system as others, I do think it has um, benefits. However, I think, yes, we could come up with a much better way and um, of thinking about speech that is less centered in um, uh, this idea of a particular speaker and their rights and their ownership of their ideas. Um, and that is some of what I am interested in doing right now in thinking about it and thinking a little bit about histories of corporate personhood and different ways in which speech has been articulated to personhood in various types of cultural and legal debates and different ways that scholars working in new technology are talking about authorship like Louise Amor and others who are thinking about um, how we might think about um, uh, speech and um, conversation in um, in the context of algorithms that we do not control and um, that shape our uh, um, the context in which we may find amplification platforms or, or, or connections. So I think there's opportunities there. Yes, to think through a different way of thinking about speech, um, a different approach, and also to push back on this like technological, like focusing on the technology and thinking about that being the question. And that is something I actually think uh, communication media scholars could have a useful role in doing and saying that is not the right question. Um, these are the questions you should be asking about this new set of technologies or this new set of um, events and instances. Here is how we should be thinking about communication in these places. Sure. Thank you, Jen. We're at time. and sorry, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Daniela. Um, what a, but a, what a great closing statement with the need to be thoughtful about the press and mindful about how scholars can inform uh, where the conversation goes in the future. Um, thank you to Xiao Chang Li, to Siva Vaidanathan, to Nitin Govil for uh, joining us today to talk about Jen's book. Thank you, Jen, for writing the book. Many congratulations. Uh, thank you everyone who joined us. The Levin Institute does a book chat every month to uh, celebrate the publications of USC authors. And um, I am posting the link for our future programs. Our next book chat is on November 2nd, where Nayan Shah will be talking about his brand new book, Refusal to Eat, A Century of Prison Hunger Strikes. So thank you for joining us uh, today, and we hope to see you next time. Congratulations, Jen. Thank you all so much.